Thank you, Bill. Uh, so, hi, uh, as Bill said, my name is Rahel Valdez. I'm a graduate student in the Freedom Lab at UCSF, and today I'll be presenting a paper that came out in May of 2013 from the Spence Lab. It's titled, Ab initio phasing using nanocrystal shape transforms with, inc with, inc with incomplete unit cells. So, uh, structural determination using extra crystallography requires obtaining phases of diffractive patterns, which are lost while uh, measuring intensities. And crystallographers have been using uh, isomorphous replacement, anomalous diffraction, or molec molecular replacement to obtain these initial phase estimates. Although these methods have been you know, extremely helpful, the limitation of these conventional approaches include the need for chemical modification or the atomic resolution data or um, a homologous protein, which can introduce uh, mo model bias. Uh, so the availability of this brief, uh, intense, and coherent X-ray pulses uh, produced by x -Bells provide uh, some additional ways to, sol to solve this phase problem. Uh, and these include um, phasing, using like uh, specific radiation damage or phasing using uh, uh, the change in anomalous scattering behavior of specific atoms. But uh, for me, for, I guess in my opinion, the most exciting x based phase approach is this ab initio phasing using uh, coherently illuminated nanocrystals. And here I'm just showing the inter um, Bragg scattering uh, that's seen in this merged nanocrystal diffraction pattern that was observed uh, because of the finite size of the crystal. And this is so exciting because um, intensities between Bragg peaks can be used to solve the phase problem. So the idea is that the Bragg reflection from a finite crystal are uh, convoluted with crystal shape transform function and they are modulated by the molecular transform function. So the molecular transform function is this continuous scattering from uh, one unit cell or molecule and it's identical for all uh, nanocrystals. And for um, the other function is this lattice transform or shape transform function which provides this inter Bragg scattering and it, different, it differs between crystals and depending on the size and shape of the crystal. Uh, so, but the, I guess the most important point that I want to make now, and it, this will become uh, uh, important later, is that uh, these, the shape transform is the same in the neighborhood around every lattice point for a specific, for a given crystal. And I'll come back to that later. And here I'm showing the equation for the diffracted intensity. As you can see, the equation is a function of these two terms. And if we can find a, a way to demodulate or disentangle these two functions, then we have a, um, a solution to the phase problem. So in order to demodulate uh, the molecular transform, uh, we must um, uh, um, uh, use the equations that I talked about earlier, but in this case, look at the averaged uh, diffraction intensity. And, and what, uh, what we can do here is after we get this equation, you have the molecular transform that is identical for each pattern, so so we uh, don't need to average the, um, that function, so it stays like this. But the um, uh, the molecular transform is averaged 
So as you can, like, just so we can see it here. So what we can do is we can just rearrange the function so that we get uh, the uh, molecular transform as a function of the mean transform and the intensities that have been recorded. So this brings up to brings us to another issue, which is how do we get the mean shape transform? Uh, so what we can do is that we can um, uh, um, average all the uh, Bragg reflection at a specific uh, reciprocal lattice point. In this case, let's call it GHKL. And uh, what, when we do that, uh, what happens is that this, uh, this is a point I was trying to make earlier, which is that the, since the molecular transform is the same in the neighborhood of every lattice point for a given crystal, uh, the shape transform becomes just uh, uh, like uh, uh, just the S itself instead of the average. So once we do that, we can partition this whole equation, and what we get is uh, the mean shape transform, and the mean shape transform can be um, inserted into the equation that I showed you earlier, and that gives us the molecular transform in terms of the measured diffractive intensities, uh, which we can use for phasing. Uh, so a previous work uh, has shown that uh, these complex molecular transforms can be recovered from nanocrystals of different size showing uh, uh, shape transforms. So what we need in order to uh, get that is that we need a large number of patterns that are available and we need uh, to be careful about um, the amplification of error and when we estimate the amplitude. Um, another limitation of the uh, previous work is that each crystal is described as a single unit cell, so which is a good approximation of when you have large crystals, but for small crystals, it's problematic because if you have uh, crystals that don't have like a common repeating uh, repeating unit cell, or or like if the edge uh, termination, if there is some kind of edge termination that produces partial unit cells, what do you do? So that brings me to the paper uh, that I'll be talking about today, and uh, this paper what is they try to do is try to address this issue of um, uh, incomplete unit cells. Um, so the experimental setup is that it's like, in summary, is like simulation of diffraction uh, by a two-dimensional nanocrystal, and they're using two molecules in unit cell, per unit cell, and uh, they have the edge terminate uh, uh, using complete unit cells. So, okay. So the molecular transformation uh, that the author used was obtained by a summing contribution from all unit cells. Um, and in their case, the full unit cell refers to this full image of a butterfly, and you have partial uh, unit cells, which refers to either the right or left part of the butterfly. And um, and the boundary, uh, sub-boundary, are randomly assigned, like a state. So the boundary they defined as uh, uh, the space between uh, these two circles, which is a gray area. And in the second image, in this image, the boundary unit cells are uh, reassigned randomly, and uh, the black colored uh, cells refers to the uh, fully occupied, uh, fully to the full unit cells, and the white is unoccupied unit cells, and the brown is um, the partially uh, partial unit cells. This 2D unit cells. 
for the simulation looks uh, uh, look like this, where you have the um, image of the full and the partial cells and their uh, scattering patterns here. So you can, and we'll come back to this uh, later. Um, and they also had this alternative uh, unit cell and its sc scattering pattern that looked something like this. And um, so what they started with is uh, doing their calculation use the, using these ideal conditions where you have infinite dynamic range and unlimited photon flux. And um, <clears throat> What I'm showing here is a diffraction pattern from about 200 crystals, and you can see the high-intensity Bragg peaks and other uh, nearby uh, uh, pixel uh, as well. And, and here, what they saw uh, when they used ideal condition was that the recovered molecular, molecular transform patterns is very nice and it's very consistent with the theoretical transform. So that's what I, the theoretical is shown here. And we have this recovered molecular transform, which looks very uh, good. And they also uh, looked at R factors. And you can see this very nice improvement in the R factor uh, be, uh, between these recovered and the molecular forms as a function of uh, uh, the number of diffraction patterns. So this is a nice improvement from 0.4 to 0.1 uh, value. So, but the main thing they wanted to do is uh, look at the partial unit cells and its uh, effect. So um, when they what they saw was this, as the fraction of the partial in cells increase, the recovery of molecular transform becomes much harder. So here I'm just showing uh, uh, the, uh, the theoretical where you have the fraction of partial to zero, and you're increasing, you have 0.1 and 0.3. They look very similar, which is really nice. And you, you can see the image. And see very well that the image, you can like reconstruct the image very well here. Mm, here is still good, so I bet you have some, uh, some, um, uh, the image from the alternative unit cell uh, shown here. But, but if we go to a fraction uh, where the unit cell fraction is like 0 0.7, 0 0.9, it starts to look more like the alternate unit cell and, and instead of the uh, default unit cell that they use. So the image uh, corresponding to those are, look something like this, so very different from the default unit cell. Um, and another interesting thing that they noticed was that where when they have a, um, the fraction of the partial being 0.5, they see this combination of the default and the alternate unit cell, and it looked something like this. And the image that corresponded to that, it looks like that, which is what's really interesting. And here I'm just showing the improvement in R factor as a function of uh, the number of patterns, and and you can see that it becomes really terrible, terrible when the the fraction of partials is like 0.9. Anything above really 0.7 is uh, the, um, where the recovery of the molecular transforms become really uh, much harder. So yeah, so I, as I was hinting at earlier, what they saw was this, as fraction of partial unit cells increase, the recovered pattern shift from the default unit cell to, to the alternate unit cell. So you have the default unit cell going up, uh, uh, the R factor is going up as the uh, 
uh, fraction of partial of cells is also going up, but then you'll see this alternate mu cell going down, which is super interesting to me. And um, but yeah, that's what they observed, which is which was really cool. And and the other thing uh, they noticed or they concluded was that the patterns can be recovered as long as the cell is favored one of the immune cells favored over the other. And that is that will become important later when you have uh, multi, you know, multiple molecules in the unit cell. How do you how do you like fractionate the uh, uh, what how do you fractionate the different unit cells that you would see? So that this is a, a little bit problematic but uh, but uh, very interesting. And okay, the other thing that they looked at is this effect of crystal uh, size variation. And uh, I guess, to my surprise, uh, the size variation did not reduce the quality of the recovered pattern. And as you can see, they did size variation ranging from 20% to 50%, but the uh, pattern looked exactly the same as what they've seen with. Uh, before, so which was really nice. Um, and uh, yeah, another uh, important factor is the data range uh, on pattern in recovery. Uh, so, so the data range that can be collected is limited by the photon flux and the detector's dynamic range. So for the photon flux, you have, if you have some low photon flux, that limits the number of photons that can be collected, less problematic. And if you have for the dynamic range of the detectors, um, what the dynamic range does is limits the intensity range that can be collected, which is also very important. Um, so they wanted to look at this, and what they saw was that. Um, the measurable, what they defined as the measurable data range is essential for the recovery of the molecular transform. And when the data range is pretty low and you have like about a thousand, it is pretty much impossible to recover the pattern. So you can see like there are factors that are super high and the image looks nothing like what they, um, what the theoretical uh, image look like. And um, when you go to 10,000, it's better. You can see similar patterns, and the R factors are OK. But um, uh, if you go as high as like 30,000, it's like really nice, and you can actu accurately recover the patterns, which is really cool. Um, and so. The other aspect is the crystal shape on pattern recovery. So what they did was uh, they set the um, mean uh, radius of uh, the new cell to be five, and they uh, they allowed a variation of about two unit cells in uh, the, the different uh, axes uh, axis. and. Uh, what they saw was that the crystal shape variation doesn't really reduce the quality of the recovered molecular transform. As you can see here, is a molecular transform that it looks really nice. But what the and uh, here I'm sh uh, what they're showing is the uh, R factor, which is 0.12, and the R factor for the alternate cell, which is pretty high, so which makes sense. Um, but the, what they noticed instead was that the fraction of partial unit cells really determined the quality of the recovered unit cell patterns instead of the, um, uh, instead of the crystal shape, uh, which we saw, which makes sense because we there had already done this earlier. Um, okay. One other interesting thing that they did was they looked at how classification of nanocrystal termination affect 
the recovery of the molecular transform. Right? Um, so what they assumed was, at first was that the, if you pre-process and classify the diffraction patterns, uh, you should be able to recover the molecular transforms for the different unit cell types. So what they did was a subpattern diffraction pattern to different classes, and uh, they used this distance between patterns, uh, between the patterns and the seeding patterns, uh, to figure out which patterns belong to which class, and um, and what they saw was that the diffraction patterns and the recovered molecular transforms, uh, uh, what they uh, sorry what they saw was that the molecular transforms can be obtained after classification, and here you have a point to. Um, uh, Point to uh, the fraction of uh, the fraction of the unit cells uh, is 0.2 it was um, partial unit cells is 0.2 and here it's 0.8 and you can see that after the reconstruction uh, you see a, a very nice uh, pattern which looks very similar to the uh, theoretical one and here you see something that looks like the alternate unit cell. Uh, pretty cool. So, in conclusion, what this paper showed was that the shape transform function can be estimated and the molecular transform amplitude can be re reconstructed using this method that, was, uh, that they described. The main point they wanted, uh, they made was that this can only happen if uh, one unit cell type dominates uh, the ensemble. What I pointed out was that the dynamic range of data is very crucial uh, for the application of their approach, and um, and which needs which they address and uh, which is uh, which will become very important. Um, uh, I guess I have some caveats, also future directions, and I guess I was mostly concerned about like where cases where you have more than two molecules per unit cell, how do you deal with that, or can you really expand this to cover any of those arrangements, which I, uh, I wasn't sure about, and the other thing is how does signal to noise affect the recovery of phases, which is partially covered by this paper, but I guess as an experimentalist, I can see this being really hard uh, to deal with in order to find the, uh, for, to recover the molecular uh, function. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all of you for listening, and, uh, and I would also like to thank the funding sources NSF, and thank you.